In this video, we're going to look at how temperature can affect the value of delta G and K. So with delta G, we normally have uh, the equation delta G naught is equal to delta H naught minus T delta S naught. So, uh, and this all has to be at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere for this to be true. Uh, that's at standard conditions. Now, the question is, is well, if, if that's true and those, those values are all normally tabulated at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, this could never work at another temperature. This could never work at like 100 degrees Celsius, for example. But actually, it can. So, um, if we look, if you look at the effect, like if you were to take a delta H, and graph it, the, the number. So if you were to graph delta H versus uh, temperature, what you would find is that there would not be a very big effect. So the, delta, the value of delta H would not change very much as you change the temperature. So if that's the case, so if we can assume, uh, if we can assume that the values of delta H and delta S um, do not change very much. Oops, one second. Do not change significantly. As a function of temperature, meaning, um, meaning that the, the values they change a little bit, but they're they're approximately the same, close enough that we can use it as an approximation. We can basically say that delta G is equal to delta H naught minus T delta S naught. And now what we have to be careful of is notice that we've dropped the delta G naught. So this is the Gibbs free energy change at any given temperature T. So what we're basically saying is we're, even though delta H is supposed to be at 25 degrees Celsius, because they don't change very much with respect to temperature, we can still use it and then what we can do is we can basically take that value that we look up in the table and plug it in at, with any temperature, even though the temperature is not at 25 degrees Celsius. So uh, this will give us a delta G. It's not a delta G naught anymore because it's not at, at 25 degrees Celsius. But this will give us a value of delta G at any temperature we want. And this has some important implications on um, the value and the sign of delta G and the, the K. And we're going to look at a chart in the, in the textbook now. So this, this chart, 18.3, um, shows us how temperature can affect delta G um, at, you know, how, how different temperatures can affect the sign of delta G. So if you take a look, let's look at the equation where we have delta G is equal to delta H naught minus T delta S naught. So for something to be spontaneous, we need a negative number. Let's just kind of write that down. So there's, there are conditions that will give us a negative number all the time, and then there will be conditions where we won't get a negative number all the time. So let's start with the condition that will give us a negative number all the time. So in, for that condition, we put a negative in for delta H, and if we want to get a negative all the time, we have to put in a positive for delta S because we're subtracting, right? So if we take a negative minus a positive, we're always going to get a negative. So if we kind of put a little buffer here, then delta G in this case will always be a negative for these values. So then in this case, it doesn't matter what value of T you have. Because it'll oh, no matter what the value of t, you will always get a negative number. So um, you can see in the first entry, delta H is negative, delta S is positive, delta G is negative um, at all temperatures. So it's spontaneous at all temperatures, and um, that'll be the case. So and in this case, if we want to think about k, well, these k's will always be uh, greater than zero because. Um, It'll always be a negative delta G, so it'll always have a uh, it'll always have a preference for the products. Now let's look at some of the intermediate cases. So let's look at where we have a negative, which is a good thing for delta H, but also a negative for delta S. So in this case, um, the delta H is, makes us happy. We're we're negative here, and then the delta S is what makes us not happy because now we're minusing a minus. So what we're going to find is that delta G is going to be, um, it'll be spontaneous, but only when T is low. And let me explain why. So 
in this case, if we if this term if this term on the left, the delta h is the good term, and this term on the right is the bad term, then we want to minimize the term on the right. And to do that, we lower the t. That will make this delta s term lower in comparison to the delta h. So this one will become spontaneous at low t. Um, and now we can start to see how t might affect the spontaneity. So let's look at the other case. So in this case, we're going to have a positive um, delta H and a positive delta T, right? So in this case, we have a good T delta S part, meaning minus a positive is going to give us a negative. And then delta H is a positive, which is the, the not so good part. That's not going to give us spontaneous. So this one is going to be spontaneous at high T, high temperature, because um, the delta S term is making us spontaneous, but the delta H term is not. So we want that delta S term to overweigh or outweigh the delta H term. Um, and then the worst case scenario all around is the positive negative, where this is going to be uh, positive at all T. Because um, the delta H is bad and the delta S is also bad, so we're going to get spontaneous. We're going to get non-spontaneous at all t. So um, this this shows you from a, a qualitative sense what the temperature effect has when you have um, when you have different signs for the delta H and delta S. What you'll notice is that the ones that depend on temperature have the same sign. And then the ones that don't depend on temperature have opposite signs. So you do, you do have to kind of go through and think about this, but this kind of gives you a little bit of a guide to how to think about this. So um, this chart basically reproduces everything I just went over uh, above, and that's, that's in the textbook. So let's look at a problem where we actually have to put this to use quantitatively. Um, so th this is going to be one where we're going to calculate a delta G and a K at non-standard temperatures. So um, you'll see it says calculate delta G and there's no naught up here, which is what we want because this is not at a standard temperature. This is not at 25 degrees Celsius and K at 1000 degrees Celsius using the information given in the table below. So to get delta G for this one, we need to figure out, um, we need to use one of our two methods. And the, one, the two methods are either to get the delta G of formation um, for the pro products in the reactants. And we can't do that here because we don't have access to those numbers. But the other way of doing it is to know that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So that's what we need to do for this, this particular problem. So we need to get a delta H and we need to get a delta S from the, date, date, the, the data that's given. And then from there, we can work on getting a, um, a, an equilibrium constant. So let's start working this out. So if we want to calculate uh, the delta H for this case of the reaction, and this is, a, this is not because this is, we're getting the data from here. So that's delta H naught. So we're going to take the products in this case, which is, we'll start with the minus 601 Uh, this is the minus 601.2 kilojoules per mole for the, um, that's for the MgO. And then we'll add to that our CO2, which is minus 393.5 kilojoules per mole. And then we're going to subtract from that the um, magnesium carbonate, which is minus 111. One four ones point seven kilojoules per mole, and so we're going to get a delta H of reaction equal to one one seven point oh kilojoules. Okay, and then we can do delta S. So again, we're going to do delta S naught of reaction, and this is going to be the products minus the reactants. So uh, we're going to put in our bracket here two one three point seven joules per Kelvin. Um, just to let you know, this should be joules per mole Kelvin. There, there's a little mistake in that unit. So joules per mole Kelvin. Um, I forgot to put that in. I just noticed that now um, in that little table there. 
but no, no big deal. So plus 26.9 joules per mole Kelvin. And then we're going to subtract from that the reactants, which is 65.9 joules per mole Kelvin. And we're going to get delta S. So delta S naught is going to equal 174.7 joules per mole Kelvin. So now let's, uh, let's set up our delta G expression to get delta G. So delta G is going to equal delta H naught minus T delta S. And notice I didn't put the naught again because it's not at standard conditions. So let's plug in our numbers. And remember, you have to plug in the numbers so that the units work out correctly. So we get 117.0 times 10 to the third joules per mole for the delta H. And now our temperature at this case is 1,000 degrees Celsius. So that's going to give us a temperature of 1,273.15 Kelvin times delta S, which is 174 0.7 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, so we've got this set up. Now notice um, we've got so we've got a set of conditions here where we have opposite signs. So our delta H is a positive and our delta S is a positive. So this reaction is going to be spontaneous at high T because the delta H is not good for spontaneity, but the delta S is good for spontaneity. So by elevating the temperature here, we're gonna be able to make this spontaneous. So if you get your value for delta G, you're gonna find that it is minus 105.4 kilojoules per mole. Um, so I converted that, I, con I did the calculation and then converted it back to kilojoules um, by dividing the answer that I get out from here by 1,000. So we see that it's spontaneous. Now, if you were to plug into here 298 Kelvin or room temperature, what you would find is that it would not be spontaneous. The number would come out to be a positive. And it, so it won't, this reaction would not be spontaneous at room temperature, but it is spontaneous when you heat the reaction up to 1000 degrees Celsius. And then so the last step is to calculate K, which is going to equal E to the minus uh, 105.4 um, kilojoules per mole. And so this is minus a minus. So we got to put that in divided by RT, which is 8.314, uh, joules per mole Kelvin times our temperature, which is uh one, two, seven, three Kelvin 0.15 Kelvin. Sorry. I ran out of room there. So for K, we're going to get 2.11 or 2.12 times 10 to the fourth. So you can get delta G by um, using delta H minus T delta S, and then from using the K is equal to the E to the minus delta G over RT, you can get also get a value. So this is it for chapter 18. This gives a introduction to all of the different parts of problems. It's very important with this chapter that you do the practice problems because they think of some clever ways of doing these things and some clever applications to chapter 16 and 17. But um, th this is all of the main content in the chapter.